Howard County, 911. Yes, we have a fire at our house. What's your address? 7005 Woodgate Drive. 101A, I've got you on the May Day. Tower 7 RIT, deploy from the Charlie side. You've got a May Day from 101. All units hold the air. Charlie to command, priority message. Firefighter Flynn fell through the floor. He's on the hose line. He's down the hose line and could not get pulled back up. The units are inside right now uh, searching for him. I'm Celeste Flynn, wife of fallen firefighter Lieutenant Nathan Flynn. And I'm Sarah Laird, wife of fallen firefighter Battalion Chief Josh Laird. This project began as a case study for the Woodscape Drive fire that killed Nate in 2018. When I met Adam and this work began, I fully expected to be here alone for this introduction. Unfortunately, Josh Laird was killed in a nearly identical fire in 2021, and I had the unfortunate honor of then meeting Sarah. There's something that we say about our friendship. I hate that we met, but I'm glad that I know you. Nate was killed in the early hours of Monday, July 23rd, 2018. Nate was a 13 year veteran with Howard County Fire and Rescue in Maryland. He loved his job. He was good at his job. He was the guy that was always reading fire books and magazines. He trained every opportunity he had. I even remember watching him study Mayday calls, listening to the communications and reading the reports. He was always working to take something useful away from close calls or line of duty losses. I've spent a lot of time in the years since Nate's death doing much of the same, but only with the Woodscape audio and reports. It's been overwhelming, painful and exhausting. And I've been asked more than a few times why. Why do I stay involved or why do I put myself through reliving these events? People wanna call it strength or say that I don't know how you do it. My answer is always that I do it for him. I do it because he can't do it for himself. It's not strength, it's honor. Honoring his commitment to take action and be better, to share knowledge, to keep the hard learned lessons moving forward. If this training helps one department respond differently to their next lightning or suspected gas involved fire, then I've done my part. It's hard to think about what could be different, what could have been different on the night of July 23rd had Nate known what he was literally walking into. Beginning at the fire scene on July 23rd, 2018, investigators from ATF, Howard County, Maryland, and the Office of the State Fire Marshal work collectively to determine the origin and cause of this fire. As the primary federal resource tasked with fire origin and cause determination, ATF assisted our partners by creating a forensic fire timeline that detailed the sequence of events before, during, and after Firefighter Flynn's May Day. Fire Dynamic Simulator, a computational fluid dynamic fire modeling program, was utilized in conjunction with testing to gain a better understanding of the flow of heat, smoke, and fire gases throughout the structure. As Captain Matthews will detail, the fire originated when a lightning-induced arcing event caused a small arc hole to form in the wall of corrugated stainless steel tubing, commonly abbreviated as CSST. The arcing event created a sustained gas flame along the ceiling of the crawl space near wood floor joists and other combustible storage items. Exactly 60 minutes after the lightning strike, firefighter Nathan Flynn called a mayday after he fell through the floor from the living room into the burning crawl space below. It's relevant to note that approximately three years after this incident, Captain Joshua Laird of Frederick County, Maryland was killed while battling a fire in a large residential structure also caused by CSST that was lightning induced failure. Both of these fires originated in the basement and both firefighter Flynn and Captain Laird were suppressing flames on the first floor when the floor beneath them collapsed, causing them to fall into the burning basement and crawl space below. This timeline video concludes with five specific educational points that were developed as a result of the ATF analysis, including a side-by-side -side comparison of similarities between these two line of duty death incidents. For additional details regarding the ATF analysis, please refer to the comprehensive ATF fire timeline report for this incident. With support from Celeste Flynn and the Howard County Fire Department, it is our intent at ATF to share this video timeline as an educational tool for the fire service. 
7005 Woodscape Drive, Clarksville, Maryland was located on a three acre lot in a suburban section of Howard County. The residence was a large, uniquely shaped, mansion-type, single-family dwelling having 7,300 square feet of above-grade living area and 1,100 square feet of finished basement. The 8,400 square feet of open living space spanned three continuous, non-compartmented levels. The fire originated in a crawl space located underneath the first floor living room. The unfinished crawl space was a unique feature accessible only from the basement via a half set of stairs and was located approximately five feet above basement floor. The crawl space and access to the crawl space was hidden from the general view with no indication of its existence, even under normal occupant activity. The entrance to the crawl space did not have a door and it was open to the basement, which allowed smoke to flow upwards and fill the entire first and second levels of the residence prior to becoming ventilation limited. The residence did not have a fire sprinkler system and no municipal fire hydrants existed in the neighborhood. The cause of the fire was classified as natural by the investigative team, resulting from a nearby lightning strike to a large tree. Associated energy from the lightning strike followed a path from the tree through the soil to a nearby underground propane storage tank. Significant physical damage was observed to both the tree and the soil leading to the propane storage tank. The propane storage tank supplied the residence through an underground copper line that transitioned to metallic corrugated stainless steel tubing, also known as CSST, that ran through the crawl space beneath the living room. In this case, the nearby indirect lightning strike energized the propane distribution system and caused the CSST routed below the living room to arc to a nearby grounded object in the crawl space. The thin stainless steel wall of the CSST melted and formed an arc as the electrical energy traveling through the CSST attempted to find a path to ground. Field fire testing was conducted that estimated this flame to be about six inches in height. The first 911 call received was from the resident at approximately 0152 AM, approximately 32 minutes after the lightning strike occurred. The residents heard electrical static on their intercom system and then eventually noted smoke in the living room. Howard County, 911. Yes, we have a fire at our house. What's your address? 7005 Woodgate Drive, Clarksville. And what's on fire? We're not sure. We just smelled smoke and we're out of the house. Okay, do you see flames? We don't see any flames. Okay. Do you see There the... was a lightning strike. Okay. Already and everyone is out? Everyone's out. Okay, I have fire, fire department on the way. We'll be there shortly, okay? Local box 5-62. Pyramid 5, 6, Pyramid Engine 101, Engine 5, 1, Pyramid Tower, 10, Italian Chief 1, Respond. 7005, Woodscape Drive, Visible Smoke from a Lightning Strike. Operate Bravo 1, Bravo 1 at 152. 5, 1, Tower 10, Engine 101, Pyramid 5, 6, Italian Chief 1, you're responding. 7005, Woodscape Drive, off Guilford Road. A lightning struck the house now, Visible Smoke, 154. At 2 a.m., Engine 51 arrives on scene and provides an on scene report, observing light smoke evident from the house and in the front yard. Engine 51 pulls around the driveway to the rear of the house to access the pool as a water supply source. They note an open door on the upper level of side C, leading to the mudroom and kitchen located on the first floor. The door was left open by the occupants when they exited to call 911. Engine 51 notices light smoke coming from the door and initially makes entry through the open door to the first floor attempting to locate the fire. The incident commander arrives on scene, positions on the front side of the house, and the chief's aide conducts a complete 360 walk around of the structure. Probably one hour. Single family, two story, smoke showing. Go ahead, start box. Five, one, single. Tower 10 to the front Tower 10 to go to the front, starting full box 200. Battalion 1 to 51. There's a pool in the back if you can position such to use your hydraulic pump. We're in 900 street. Tower 10's on location, positioning side alpha. Age command. I've got two stories on side, Charlie. I've got smoke in the basement. With glass slider access on side Delta and side Charlie. I've got finished basement and I do have smoke conditions. Very good. 
finished basement, smoke conditions, with a slider on Charlie and Delta. Fire turn off, ready to come in. Go ahead. Fire one of them. Okay, one. Go ahead. We pull around back to use the uh, pool, and we're going to make entry from the back. The owner talked, talked to the owner, and he said most of heavy smoke was in the basement area. The tiny one's correct. Fifty six, do you have two out duties? Okay, one and one, you've got a second line pulled in your own Charlie. Come in to Tower 10. Tower 10. I had heard you call fire attack, but didn't hear them answer you. Do you have a message? Yeah, I was just telling them I was having 51 redeploy the line to the basement. We're currently uh, exterior right now, outside Charlie. Get ready to make entry. When Engine 5 1 entered the first floor mudroom, they were unable to locate the fire and they observed thick smoke conditions from floor to ceiling on the first floor, as well as heat conditions coming from the tiled floor below them. Engine 5 1 believed they had a fire below them, and at 2.08 a.m., they repositioned their hose line from the first floor mudroom entrance to the at grade walkout basement entrance located on the lower level of side Charlie of the residence. All right, confirming that you're making entry with 51 from that same location on the Charlie side. That's correct. Command all units, we do have an all clear from the occupants. Occupied times three, all clear the house. We do have an all clear. Command two, fire attack, engine 51, and can report. Engine 51, charge the 300 foot line. Fire says, 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 fire fire on floor number one on the Charlie side. Is that correct? That is correct. Can you hit the fire from the exterior? You need to wait for a line. Back up to the initial entrance. When you talk the initial entrance, you're talking the alpha side, is that correct? Yeah, side Charlie. No, you mean the initial entrance on side Charlie. 101, advise which quadrant you have fire showing from. Tower 10 to command. Tower 10, go ahead. It's going to be quadrant 2, 101. And then your five one are making entry right now. We had made access to the basement. We still had smoke from floor to ceiling. I closed the door back up. Only crews you should have in are on the first level, entering side Charlie. At 2.18 a.m., with no obvious indication of fire in the basement, and with visible flames now reported on the first floor, crews withdraw from the basement, close the basement door, and reposition back to the initial open entrance door on the first floor, accessing the mudroom, the kitchen, and the living room. With the basement door now closed, the visible flames on the first floor begin to decay and are no longer visible to crews. Firefighter Flynn advances a hose line from engine 5-1 through the open door into the first floor above the crawl space. Firefighter Flynn then falls into the burning crawl space below the living room. Firefighter Flynn and his officer immediately transmit Mayday radio calls for assistance. Very well. Power to command, you're at 15 minute mark. 
command director at the 15-minute mark. Go ahead and give me the task force. Check. Unit calling the Mayday. Unit calling the Mayday. Go ahead. All right, man. It's 101, Portable A. 101A, I've got you on the Mayday. Tower 7 RIP, deploy from the Charlie side. You've got a Mayday from 101. All units hold the air. One and one, go ahead with your mayday. Tower 10 and 51, can you advise on 101's mayday? All I hear is the basement. Tower 10, it sounds like she fell through the basement. Very well, 51, you're trying to find her. Molly, I understand that you've fallen into the basement. Command to Howard, give me the second alarm and keep them on Bravo 6. Charlie to command, priority message. Molly is out. Go ahead, Charlie. Go ahead, Charlie Division. We've got 101's officer is out. We are still looking for Flynn, firefighter Flynn. Okay, you've got 101's officer out, still looking for Flynn. That would be 101. Bravo Portable. Advise on 51 screw. Charlie, do command with an update on the uh, lost firefighter. Go ahead, Charlie. Firefighter Flynn fell through the floor. He's on the hose line. He, he's down the hose line and could not get pulled back up. The units are inside right now uh, searching for him. Confirm he did go down one level and he fell through a fire uh, hole in the floor. So from the Charlie side, he is down one level. He is on a sub-basement level. Is that correct? He is one floor below the grade level at the front door. After the hole forms above the burning crawl space, high temperature, high velocity fire exhaust gases flow upwards through the hole and throughout the first floor, forcing crews to evacuate from their first floor and reposition to the basement entrance to search for firefighter Flynn and suppress the fire. At 2.27 a.m., the rapid intervention team enters the basement through the at-grade side C entrance to search for firefighter Flynn. Charlie Division, confirm for me we had a par on 51. Do we have a par on Tower 10? And we're still missing one firefighter, and you've got 71 in the truck deployed. I have a par on 51. I have 71 and Tower 7 deployed. Tower 3 is about to deploy. Tower 10 is out of air and switching out. How are the commands? Go ahead, if urgent. Getting the emergency identifier 101V partable should be Flynn. Command to Firefighter Flynn. Command to Firefighter Flynn. We still got 71 and truck 7 deployed and Tower 3 deployed in an effort to find Firefighter Flynn. You were direct. We had an emergency identifier on Flynn. I am direct. I would also recommend getting a transport unit caught around back. Uh, for when we're able to get him out. He's going to probably need medical attention. I'm direct. EMS-1 should have that. Make sure they're on the lower side, not up by 51. Come around the Delta side. Charlie Division, Engine 22, Engine 91, 
and 61. We're coming to you, all part of writ number two. At 2.41 a.m., after suppressing flames in the crawl space, the rapid intervention team locates firefighter Flynn unconscious in the crawl space below the living room. Command to rip, Captain Love. Rip to command. Go ahead, rip. We got firefighter Flynn. He's PMS to the Charlie Star basement doors. All right, Rick, you have Firefighter Flynn, and you're on the Charlie side basement door. EMS-1, are you direct? Division Charlie, are you direct? Command 2, Howard. Go ahead and give me the evacuation zone. Charlie Division, I want all units pulled out. With Flynn found, all units pulled out, and give me a par as soon as you can. Copy, we're evacuating all units. Howard, all units, evacuate. How are all units evacuate the scene? Authority command. Charlie to command. Flynn is out of the building. ATF generated five conclusions or educational points resulting from the timeline video analysis, fire testing, and computer fire modeling. The first conclusion was the extremely large volume of the residents allowed for well-developed fire despite only light smoke conditions showing on the exterior. The residents at 7005 Woodscape Drive consisted of approximately 8,400 square feet of open living space that spanned three continuous non-compartmented levels. At this fire, the volume of the house was almost three times larger than what many firefighters routinely encounter. Generally, as a dwelling fills with dense smoke, the fire will become ventilation limited and the heat release rate, the fire size, will only decrease once the smoke layer banks down to the level of the flames. Under similar circumstances, a fire that has three times more air available will be allowed to release three times more energy prior to becoming ventilation limited. This increased fire growth, fire duration, and total heat release creates additional fire suppression challenges and also increases the potential for structural collapse. A fire that is allowed to burn freely for a longer period of time prior to becoming ventilation limited will also consume more fuel. This extended burn period can result in greater consumption to combustible structural members, which further increases the risk of structural collapse. Firefighters could use the height of the smoke layer to assist in locating the level of the seat of the fire. It is often safest to attack the fire from the same level of the flames or a level below where possible. In addition, personnel should consider the level of the fire when determining how much oxygen may be available to the fire prior to their arrival. A basement fire that is open to the entire residence will have considerably more air to support fire growth when compared to a fire on the upper level that becomes ventilation limited much faster. An identical fire that occurs on the second level of Woodscape Drive would only have one third of the air available to support combustion prior to fire department arriving. In conclusion, firefighters should be aware that large volume structures, large houses are inherently challenging as they support higher heat release rates, increased total heat energy released, increased total mass loss and consumption of fuels to include combustible structural components, and they require greater suppression resources to absorb the additional energy released from the fire. Conclusion number two was that the elevated fire located in the basement crawl space created atypical smoke conditions in the basement. The fire developed in an elevated crawl space located above the basement floor, and this resulted in atypical smoke layer conditions in the basement, including light elevated smoke layer in the basement, 
with relatively dense smoke on the first and second levels. There was more smoke upstairs than there was in the basement where the fire started. When crews initially entered the first floor, they immediately encountered dense smoke from floor to ceiling and identified heat signatures consistent with a basement fire below them. The crews then decided to reposition to the basement level. The same crew then opened the basement door and identified what they called cold smoke and minimal heat conditions in the basement. What they experienced was inconsistent with the basement fire. The elevated crawl space opening was visually obstructed and crews could not immediately locate the seat of the fire in the crawl space. The fire conditions observed were inconsistent with the basement fire, but also inconsistent with the fire on the first level. In reality, the crews correctly identified conditions consistent with an elevated fire in the elevated crawl space. The fire was in fact below the first floor and also in fact above the basement level. It is important for the fire service to understand elevated fire dynamics as CSST is frequently located in the interstitial space between the basement and the first floor. Elevated fires often result in thick smoke on floors located above the fire and minimal smoke located in the level where the fire originated. The relatively complex fire dynamics associated with elevated fires are rarely taught to the fire service and fire investigation community. Firefighters should ensure that the basement is completely free of smoke and fire, including the basement ceiling where CSST may be routed. Conclusion number three. After the floor collapsed, a high temperature, high velocity ventilation flow path from the basement through the hole and out of the first floor created untenable conditions for units operating on the first floor during the mayday. This ventilation flow path caused interior fire conditions on the first floor to rapidly deteriorate at the time of the mayday and become untenable for interior crews operating on the first floor attempting to make the rescue of firefighter Flynn. This same ventilation exhaust flow path prevented rescue of firefighter Flynn on the first floor through the hole at the time of the mayday as heated fire exhaust gases from the free burning crawl space vented upwards through the hole and created untenable conditions for firefighters on the first floor. Firefighters then realized the only way to facilitate the rescue was to attack the flames and enter from the basement and crawl space along the ventilation flow path inlet. Rescue crews encountered flames throughout the crawl space as they advanced to the sound of firefighter Flynn's alarming SCBA. Computer fire modeling indicated high velocity unidirectional exhaust gases from the first floor exterior during this time. Crews on scene stated that they believed the mudroom was approaching flashover conditions during the mayday and RIT company operations in the basement. This observation was supported by computer fire modeling simulations as well as videos captured during the fire. Conclusion number four, corrugated stainless steel tubing, CSST, and its location has associated structural collapse risks. Firefighter Flynn fell through a hole in the living room floor downwards into the burning crawl space below. The pressurized propane gas that flowed through the CSST arc hole ignited and it burned for approximately 60 minutes prior to consuming the combustible structural floor members located below the floor in the crawl space. Fire testing indicated that the relatively massive non-combustible top layers of the floor, the tile on the cement board, mass the heat signatures one might expect from a fully involved crawl space fire and the structurally compromised flooring system that supported the floor from below. Due to the common placement of CSST fueled appliances in the basement, as well as on the first floor, including the kitchen and living room, CSST is frequently routed through the combustible structural void space between the basement ceiling and the first floor. In addition, unlike iron fuel pipe, multiple parallel CSST gas lines are frequently routed through combustible interstitial spaces as one CSST branch line supplies each individual gas appliance. This equates to more linear installed feet of CSST gas piping as compared to similar iron pipe fuel gas installations. In addition, multiple CSST arc holes can result from a single lightning strike event. This can result in multiple concurrent fires located throughout a structure at the same time. The location of CSST gas lines proximal to structural members can support sustained burning of these structural members, 
which can lead to structural compromise and collapse from the first floor into the burning basement. This collapse risk is compounded by the fact that CSST fires can remain concealed in structural void spaces above the basement and flames are often first visible on the first floor level, causing firefighters to operate above the seat of the fire with weakened structural components below them. There are no reliable indicators of pending structural collapse for firefighters, and firefighter Flynn was likely unaware of the fire in the crawl space below him. Firefighters should also be aware that CSST arc holes in subsequent gas ignition can occur due to arcing contact of CSST with energized electrical branch circuits unrelated to lightning exposure. Not all CSST related fires result from lightning. It should also be noted that CSST fires can occur anywhere that CSST is routed, including wall cavities, attics, and garages. CSST is also frequently installed in multi-unit residential structures. Conclusion number five was the realization of an additional lightning-induced corrugated stainless steel tubing CSST line of duty death incident. This incident occurred on August 11th, 2021, approximately three years after the line of duty death of firefighter Nathan Flynn. Captain Joshua Laird of Frederick County, Maryland Fire and Rescue died while battling a fire in a large residential structure caused by lightning induced failure of CSST in the basement. Captain Laird called the mayday and was killed after falling through a hole from the first floor into the burning basement below him where the fire originated. Engine 251, Friday. Engine 251. On the scene, large, three and a half, two and a half story single family. Uh, we do have a working fire, gun, start to rate, and probably a tiger tap. Engine 251 on scene, advising two story single family working fire, requesting red and tanker task force, 1652. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Captain Laird, engine 251. I've stolen through the floor in the fire room. Thank you, Captain Mayday. Main copies of Mayday, engine 231. Engine 231's officer, did you copy? Yeah, can you confirm if he fell through the basement or if he's just stuck in the first floor? Hey, he fell from the uh, block of the fire room here on the Charlie side into the basement. He was just in the window, fell through. I'm through the basement. That's all, away from where I was. It was burning up. 251's officer. Can you hear me? I can only hear you right here. Alright, right, we need to go through from the fire and burn it up. Alright, we got a line. Probably the best thing you can do is drop a ladder, run into this hole, put the fire out, and I'll walk out. G 15 1 command. We got a line in the building now. And they're going to try and get to the basement to get them out. Who take the Charlie division? Right now, we got the cruise assembling. We saw verbal contact. We're unable to make access via the fire floor to get down there. I've just sent Rescue Squad 3 and the captain from 231 to another basement entrance to see if they can transverse from the other side of the house to make access. Okay. Yeah, I'll take 9900 to Captain Laird. Engine 251 Alpha, come in. Where are you? What quadrant? I'm going to see you going out there. 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 Come on. Come on, family. I'm going to see you going out there. 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 I'm going to see you going out Priority one, category A. Landing site will be the scene. Charlie Division, did you copy? That's right. Give me an EMS unit to the Delta side. I would also like a company that can cut a chain link fed. That will be the fastest extraction. Units, hold your trap. Command, the firefighter's out. Here's the unconscious. She's in the care of medic 23. Copy. Commander Frederick, sound the evacuation code. Project all units, all road command has ordered emergency evacuation, 1717.
ATF investigated and generated detailed fire origin and cause reports for both the Woodscape Drive and the Ball Road line of duty death incidents. Both residences were large, type 5, lightweight, wood-framed single-family residences, and neither residence had a fire sprinkler system installed. Both fires originated in an unfinished portion of the basement or the crawl space as a result of a lightning strike event. The square footage of both residents was approximately three times larger than the average dwelling size frequently encountered by firefighters. Both fires originated in an unfinished, elevated portion of the residence located at the ceiling level between the basement and the first floor. At Woodscape Drive in Howard County, lightning-induced failure of the CSST gas line located in the basement ceiling of the crawl space caused a single arc hole to form. The structure of the crawl space and the nearby stored Christmas decorations ignited as a result of the escaping propane gas. At Ball Road in Frederick County, a lightning strike caused multiple lightning-induced arc holes to form in the wall of the CSST gas line, which resulted in sustained burning located along the unfinished ceiling portion of the basement. Christmas decorations were also stored in this area and eventually ignited in the basement as a result of the gas-fed fire. Both residents had large open floor plans and smoke was allowed to fill the basement, first and second levels prior to fire department arrival. This extended fire pre-burn time prior to the arrival of the fire department resulted in consumption of structural floor members located between the basement and the first floor. Flames were first visible to firefighting crews on the first floor at both incidents. Firefighters were actively fighting flames on the first floor when a collapse occurred from the first floor into the burning basement below, prompting the mayday calls. I've fallen through the floor in the fire room. I had to evacuate away from where I was. It was burning up. Woodscape Drive in Howard County, the crews were unable to locate the fire in the elevated crawl space due to the complexities in the layout of the basement. At Ball Road, the resident had no basement windows and there was no obvious indication that the structure had a basement except for a small exterior basement staircase that was partially concealed on side delta of the residence. Captain Laird was unable to complete a full 360-degree size-up of the residence at the time of the fire due to fencing in the area of the staircase. Captain Laird did not notice the exterior basement stairway prior to entering the structure to suppress flames on the first floor. Captain Laird was likely unaware that the residence had a basement prior to his mayday call. When floor collapse occurred at both structures, a large hole formed above the seat of the fire between the basement and the first floor. This additional ventilation provided above the fire resulted in high temperature, high velocity fire gases flowing upwards from the basement through the hole and into the first floor. Both firefighters immediately transmitted mayday calls for help over the radio after falling into the burning basement and crawl space below. Rescue crews at both fires immediately heard these mayday calls for help and attempted to rescue the Mayday firefighters from the first floor through the hole into the basement below. However, high temperature gases from the flow path from the basement to the first floor, as well as the unstable structural conditions, ultimately prevented a successful rescue from the first floor. At Ball Road, rescue crews attempted to flow water as well as position ladders down the hole into the basement at the time of the Mayday. However, the free burning fire in the basement resulted in untenable conditions on the first floor of the structure. RIT crews at both fire scenes eventually repositioned to the exterior at great entrance to the burning basement and accessed the Mayday firefighter through the basement entrance. Both Mayday firefighters were successfully rescued and removed via the basement exterior entrance. At both line of duty death incidents, Despite immediate mayday calls for help, quick action by the RIT crews and fellow firefighters, both Firefighter Flynn and Captain Laird were unable to quickly escape the extreme temperature and smoke conditions in the basement at the time of the mayday. The gas-fed fires located at the ceiling level between the basement and the first floor resulted in flames first being visible to firefighters on the first floor. 
as well as consumption of the structural members between the basement and the first floor, and the ultimate collapse and mayday calls at both line of duty death incidents. If a lightning strike or fuel gas system fire is suspected, firefighters should gain access and rule out fire spread on all levels of the structure, beginning in the basement or the lowest level. Special attention should be paid to the flooring system between the basement and the first floor as collapse into the basement is possible if a fire originated in this concealed area. Immediately controlling the utilities, including natural gas or propane, should be considered if a lightning strike event is suspected. Wednesday, August 11th was a typical summer day. Josh left for work before I got up. I spent the day at work. We spoke on the phone at lunchtime when I went home to check on our girls. Around 3.30, the weather began to decline, so I told my staff to leave early to try to get ahead of the storm. By 5 p.m., the sky had cleared and the sun was shining. My girls and I were getting ready to go shopping for a birthday gift when a firefighter in my neighborhood appeared in my driveway and told me someone was hurt and he thought it might be Josh. When I returned home several hours later, I had to tell my daughters that their dad was never coming home. I too had a new title, widow. We were not the only ones forever changed by the events of August 11th. Josh was a 21 year veteran of Frederick County Department of Fire and Rescue Services. His loss and Nate's loss have profoundly affected the fire service at large. A few days after Josh's death, Celeste reached out to me through the department to offer support. At the time, I wasn't ready, but eventually I Googled her. I read a news story about Nate's fire and instantly understood that we were bonded together in the most horrific way. If Josh had the information and knowledge you are receiving today, he might still be here.